Oh, just about. When I found out that I could take uh, a class over, that was that was brilliant. You know, that was uh, that was beauty. I, I had no idea I could take classes over. I took calculus seven times. Oh my. ADHD Rewired episode 107. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Audible and TomNardone.net. Have you read Brene Brown's newest book, Rising Strong? Let me tell you, I have been there. You've been there. All of us have been there at some point. We dared greatly and failed. Been hurt, disappointed, rejected. It's the struggle. To me, Rising Strong is a call to action. It is the message that says, if I'm going to do meaningful work, if I'm going to dare greatly and put myself out there again and again, I am going to fail. I am now listening to Rising Strong for a second time. I'm leaning in even more this time and finding more strength and courage that sometimes I forget that I have. Get this book read by Brene Brown for free on Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for a free download and a 30-day free trial. That's audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired for your free audiobook download. And while we are on the topic of books Have you picked up your copy of Chasing Kites by Tom Nardone? Every person who I've spoken to about this book describes almost a grief process of this book coming to an end. Yes, it's actually that good. Go to TomNardone.net and get a copy. Do it. TomNardone.net. You're going to love this book. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I am here in the virtual ADHD Rewired studios with my guest, Cameron Gott, who is a professional certified coach. He coaches creative and resourceful entrepreneurs and leaders nationwide to help them create the focus they want and the follow through they need. He's a mentor coach and also an instructor at both Coach Approach for Organizers.com and Atka.com. Cameron, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Eric, it's really great to be here. So it's a real treat. Thank you. So where do you want to begin your story? Because I know that when you reached out to me uh, with interest for being on this show, one of the things that you said is that you really want to share kind of the story that, that you have about articulating ADHD. Would that be a good place to start? Um, certainly. I think um, it's something that's, that has um, impacted my life. Um, and so I think sharing my own story about that might be able to help others. Um, of, I think the significance or importance of being able to articulate one's experience um, you know, awareness is so impacted by ADD. Mm -hmm. And um, so getting that accurate read is so important to that self-knowledge because I feel that self-knowledge is really, it's number one in, you know, in fighting the the negative impact of ADD. I think that's that's self-knowledge is, I think, the, the most important piece of knowledge we as just human beings can have. Right. Absolutely. You know, I think that the whole idea of metacognition, it's, I think, um, I've heard it quoted that half the people in the world don't think about thinking. That's scary and not surprising all at the same time. Right. So, um, I, I sort of, I think about 
my life. And, um, you know, there was a period where that certainly was the case for me because it was so easy for me to just slip into my dream state. I was diagnosed with inattentive ADD. And so that sort of ability just to slip out of the present and, and into some rich, uh, a world of imagination and <laughs> Oh my goodness. You know, it was much more enticing than what the teacher was putting up on the board at that moment. So, um, I was not diagnosed, you know, early on because I was not a problem. I would, I would sit there and I was the kid, the teachers loved me, you know, they just, cause I was kind and, and, uh, uh, gentle, a gentle giant, I was, yeah. uh, the biggest kid in the class. Really? And, oh yeah. I was about six, six and uh six, six now, but I was, wow. I was always ahead above everyone else. I was sort of the spacey, uh, spacey dorky kid, you know, <laughs> who, who tried to that succeed. would describe me pretty accurately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the, um, it was, uh, well after my diagnosis that I sort of stumbled upon this whole notion of, uh, articulating ADD. Well, how, what, well tell me about your diagnosis. How, how old were you when you were diagnosed? So, um, I was working at a small Quaker school in North Carolina and we had a, uh, we had an in-service with a gentleman from UNC named David Parker, who was a learning specialist there. And he came out and was doing, um, an in-service on, um, ADD and, and kids of special needs, but it, the focus was ADD. And, um, he put us actually the retreat, our place was uh, such that the school was, was such that, uh, we would do retreats at, at teachers' houses. And actually the, the retreat was in my living room. And I remember sitting in the middle of my living room and he put a, a, a shot on the, the screen and it had two types of ADD. And I knew about the, the hyperactive. Uh, right. That's, that's what most people think of when they think of ADHD is the hyperactive impulsive boy typically. Right. And um, well, and I, I, I knew that well because when I was a teacher in Baltimore, I would take kids – on trips down to North Carolina for this outdoor leadership program. And it was during the summer. And I remember parents would, they would give their kids vacation, uh, medication vac vacations. Lucky for you. Lucky for me. And they, they put them in the, they, these two kids would get in the back of the van and they sang uh, over and over this, this uh, one song all the way down to North Carolina for 14 hours. And what was that song? Um, oh, it was, um, the, da, 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 da. Oh my God. The entire but it was always, way. Uh, we'd say, um, did you, you know, do what we asked you to do? Yes, 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 yes. The entire way. The entire way. And no, 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 no. And it just was, uh, and you couldn't reason with them, you know, and we couldn't dump them off at a rest stop. So we had to figure out how to work with them. So that was my experience of ADD is uh, very energetic uh, very enthusiastic, um, very pervasive uh, children. And uh, these guys were lovable. They were absolutely, you know, you, you couldn't not like them. I mean, they were funny. So, um, but also trying at times. So I'm sitting in my, a couple of years later, I'm sitting here and David Parker puts up this slide of the, the, the one I knew and then the one I didn't know. And as I'm reading down that, you know, the, the, the nine different, uh, characteristics, right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, I was like, I, I sat there and, and blurted to everyone. I was like, Oh my God, there I am. You know, that's me. That's me. And so you're there as a teacher and he had this like, Oh my God moment. Right. So, so, uh, and in that moment I realized, uh, you know, all this understanding and self-knowledge, right, came crashing through the door. Um, but it was also just the beginning because that was when I was 28, and that's 22 years ago. I'm 50 now. And I think that, um, you know, I've had lots of opportunities to articulate ADD over the years, you know. and So that was the first time it was articulated to you, and right. then you uh, – this kind of self-awareness, self-knowledge was completely reframed for you. 
uh, uh, at the state and it was at your home, right? During this, this, it was in my house. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was really interesting how I was a first year student. I remember, you know, someone was like, we got to have a retreat. Who's going to hold it? You know, and no one put their hand up. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, kind of on the ADHD like, oh, year I'll, to be like, Oh, I'll do it. What did I just sign up for? <laughs> yeah. But, um, that same school is where we had, uh, there were no grades. Yeah, uh, tell me about what, so you mentioned this, this is a Quaker school. Right. It's a Quaker school. What is that just, like? Cause I mean, um, I could only imagine. Uh, so give us, give us a kind of a, a paint us a picture of what, what that means. Okay. So I'm just a, picturing a guy on the oatmeal cover. Uh, you yeah, know, so, of course. Yeah. With the black brass box. Right. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So um, there's, it's a different kind of Quaker school. So when people think about Quaker schools or friends schools, um, they often think of uh, this, these old schools that were established in the late 1700s uh, in Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey, and uh, Baltimore area. Okay. So they're, um, they have, most of them have sort of moved away from the Quaker meeting and have become basically prep schools. Okay. So what does that mean? The Quaker meeting? I mean, it's just an interesting kind of uh, like knowledge gap that I, that I have. <laughs> sure. Sure. So um, Quakers, you know, came out of Pennsylvania with, um, uh, you know, gosh, now, now we're looking at someone's going to say, no, no, that's not all right, Cam. I want to say William Penn, but um, I'm, I'm, you know, someone's going to say, geez, you're, you're a Quaker, Cam. Um, so Quakers believe that God is pretty much, in everything and everywhere. And the meeting is instead of a church service where someone is um, up in the pulpit, a Quaker meeting is where you sit in a round and it's really about silence. Okay. So they have their tenants um, or principles that are great to live by. You know, the truth is always revealed um, to shine the light and goodness um, on others they tend to be pacifists, um, anti-war uh, often is the case. Uh, Quakers were those few white guys that marched with Martin Luther King in 1968. Many of them were Quakers. Um, so they tend to be activists. Um, and um, I went to a Quaker school in Baltimore. Um, I got in. It was At that time, it was a prep school. Um, a uh, friend school of Baltimore. My, my, I got in on the coattails of my sister, um, who is a neuro, uh, is a, excuse me, a, um, retinal surgeon out in Montana. Um, we, we joke, we talk in our family that we have an MD and two ADDs. That's, <laughs> that's who we have. So, um, so I didn't have to take the test. And if I, I imagine if I had to take the test, I wouldn't have gotten in. I, I'm pretty certain that I kind of bumped along and we go up and we do our Quaker meeting once a week and we sit in silence and throw spitballs at everyone, you know, and then um, there's a, there's a strong sense of um, service with Quaker communities. Mm -hmm. And so that's very big in Quaker schools, um, a sense of, uh, of service. And then really the difference between the one down in North Carolina where I taught was it was really um, teaching the, the whole child. So, um, this comes back to this no grades notion and the fact that as a teacher, I had to comment on the uh, academic progress of a child, um, the uh, academic, uh, spiritual, um, social, um, physical, and uh, there's one more that I'm missing here. But again, that sort of whole picture of the child. That we nurture and educate the whole so child. not just how well did they take a test right and so it wasn't um i had to take all the now i did give i was a math and science teacher and an outdoor education teacher and um we had to uh you know i would give tests of course and take all those grades that i had from quizzes and, and tests which by the way were sitting on my counter you know, not graded uh, until two days before the end of the trimester. I, I don't know if I've ever met a teacher with ADHD who has not described their grading process to be very much like that. 
Right. So, and my first time, my first year, my first uh, grading period, I was actually in a car accident uh, that knocked me out Oh man! Um, during that period. So I was out of school for a week. I come back and they're like, and Quakers are lovely. I mean, they're just lovely people. And they're like, Whenever you want to get it to us, you know, and which is the worst kind of deadline for someone with ADHD it is the worst kind of deadline. Well, this is before I knew I had ADD, right? I mean, I'm still not sure what's going on. And so, um, meanwhile, the second trimester has started already, right? So I'm back teaching and I'm oh. trying to, uh, uh, collate, organize, synthesize, and then uh, from, for 80 children trying to take this information and write a glowing narrative, page-long narrative on for their For 80 children. For, for, for 80 kids. And, and, and also, I was never, never a, a, a competent or a, you know, a, a capable writer. You know, so I, so I feel I feel your pain beyond like belief. I mean, it's oh. So how did you get through that? Um, well, I didn't really. I mean, I you know, I slogged myself. I slogged my way through that, and and it's sort of again, it's that with ADD, it's the recognizing there's a challenge, but not really doing anything about it you know it's like being with the struggle um over and over and i worked there six years so that was you know 18 different experiences of this end of term trimesters right three times a year uh you know i had 18 times to get better at it um when i got my diagnosis and i started taking medication that certainly helped you know, it certainly helped with the ability to stay on task, to stay focused, um, to stay. So how long was it between you having this meeting in your house where you're reading the, the nine symptoms of inattentive, uh, what they probably called then the inattentive type of, of ADHD. Right. And he had this, that's me. What was the kind of time frame and, and kind of uh, steps between that moment and actually getting a diagnosis where you're beginning to actually, uh, uh, get you know the benefits of treatment from medication. Um, well, that's a great question, you know, and that's sort of that foggy history. That it, I mean, I imagine it hap- It was within a year. Okay. Um, I'm sure it wasn't the next day. You know, in my mind, it sort of felt like the next day. But knowing me, you know, that I was like, okay, I got ADD, and and and, well, and I got to schedule that, you know, meeting. You know, I got to go get diagnosed. Right, <laughs> right. You you get it. Yeah, I mean, it's, and it's funny too because I think back to my story of, of my diagnosis when I I had this. Uh, and I talk about it on the very first episode of the podcast, um, where you know I had this kind of chance meeting with this uh, with this girl at in college who I still do not remember who it was. I like I I so wish I did so I could thank her because sure. it was that information that you know really changed the course of everything. And I went that next day and made an appointment for an evaluation, which was so profoundly unlike me that because I knew that like that I think I just found the key to to uh, everything that I was struggling with. And I knew if I did not unlock this this door that I was going to be there's no way I was going to be able to continue with college because I was already on a second chance that I really shouldn't not have been given. Uh, So (laughs) she she hit you with a two by four. Right. (laughs) Right. Sometimes right. It so, takes that. Yeah, you know, it, it was I almost fell out of school and um and I was able to get one more chance at school despite having atrocious grades two semesters in a row. Oh, and, I uh, um I can beat you there, brother. <laughs> <laughs> bring it, bring it, Cameron. What 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 you got? Um you know, it was um I, the really interesting thing, I I, I was thinking about this it, prior to our conversation today that um i kind of insulated myself i think the the good thing about working at carolina friends school was um the people around me at first were extremely intimidating because of just who they were it was sort of like these renaissance people with all these advanced degrees and they were um peace corps and you know 
these amazing accomplishments and, and all before age 30. And there's sort of this, I, I, that was the first time I really noticed that expectation gap, you know, it was like here and, and that really was difficult for me. Um, you know, I, I was thinking, when are they going to find me out? You know, the, the fraud that I am, I shouldn't be here because I don't belong. And so at school, I really insulated myself by, you know, hanging out with people who had similar expectations. Um, I, I hung out with a group that basically three quarters of them were gone within two years. Um, I was at the University of Maryland. Um, I didn't get into any schools that I wanted to get into. Maryland back then, Maryland now is a great school. Uh, Maryland in 1983 was a complete backup school. Um, and I remember sitting there with the gentleman and he, he had a ruler and he put it across and it was like grade point average on one side and SAT on the other. And he just took the, he was like, yeah, you barely got in buddy. And he's like, reaches over. Congratulations. You're in. <laughs> so, um, I was there six years. Okay. Um, it took, it took me five, but well, I, I was a year away skiing. Uh, when I realized, uh, it's like the, uh, the, the 1.3 GPA, um, for the Oh yeah, you did, you did worse than I did for the fourth time. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait 1.3 for the fourth time. Oh, just about when I found out that I could take, uh, a class over that was, that was brilliant. You know, that was, uh, that was beauty. I, I had no idea I could take classes over. I took calculus seven times. You, you, you won. Oh my, that's, uh, I mean, that's somewhere between persistence and torture, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so calculus, you know, it was, uh, I was a geology major, right. And I did, I going out in the field, I got an A in all the field work, right. Cause I had that spatial ability to see the, see the geology, right. And how it just went underground. I could see it where others couldn't that high associative ability, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then in a the lab, you know, where they give you 35 green minerals and say, you know, you need to identify these and you need to go through a systematic process to identify them. And Oh, by the way, you're on your own for the next 16 weeks, you know, would just be kill me would absolutely kill. Um, so, and I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Where were we? Uh, geology, um, calculus seven times. Ooh, thank you. Yes, calculus. I we think win. I, we I got, think I we got go the back train to back on the tracks. <laughs> right. So the um, calculus was, it was the uh, engineering calculus we had to take, which I really don't understand why. But I, there was a two-semester course, and I took the first semester um, – the, the, I took it four times. I had to get the Dean's approval for the fourth time I took it. And I finally got it. And I remember sitting in her office and I, and I must've like done the puppy eyes or something. Cause she kind of smiled and was like, you know, okay. All righty. <laughs> so the other thing Eric is really funny is that my mom, who's much like me, I'm not going to say she's ADD, but you know, uh, the, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. The fact that, that Maryland was $666 a semester was allowed me to keep going there. It was like, well, you know what? It's only 666 bucks. So, okay. You know, so I kind of kept going and I, I, it was basically just s surviving each semester. Not, not like, per class per semester. Yes, yeah, six hundred and sixty-six oh, wow. bucks. It was in state. You know, this is back in now. That was wow. uh, eighty-three. I that was back that. when like anyone can really afford college. That's right. That's right. I'm. Uh, I've got two kids, and I just I'm not looking forward to that whole process in five years. I, I am hoping as just a, a sidebar that uh, if if you have young kids today, that by the time they are in college, because there's no way it's sustainable. And I think that we are in a, a college kind of bubble. Um, and I think similar to the housing bubble, I think it's going to, I think it's going to pop. I um, hope it pops. So I hope it pops too, because it's absurd. It's absurd. It is. All right. Continue. Completely. So stepping off my, uh, my soapbox here. <laughs> sure. So I guess we were back at, are we going back to 
So I, I derailed the train I this time. Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> we are wherever we want to be. So I think we were um, we were talking about the cost of school. You were able to keep going because the cost of school was uh, six hundred and sixty six dollars. Um, right, and I would say that the reason I did graduate with a degree was because I found a little group of people on a giant campus um, and these amazing professors who I started to make a connection with, right? When I was sitting in that calculus class with 400 kids, I couldn't make that connection with the individual. And in um, the geology program is this tiny little building nestled in between these massive, you know, huge brick coliseums um, of the engineering program and computer science and business. And the, the little geology program was right there. And they really took an interest in you. You know, there were, there were real characters, um, interesting people. And that sort of got me engaged, you know, sort of like, I was like, I like these people and they like me. And that kind of started to fill, you know, that sense of Mm self-worth, which wasn't there, started to fill. And I started to believe, you know, maybe I can do this because all during that time, I really didn't think I was going to, you know, I didn't think I was going to graduate. I really didn't have that belief that, that it was um, a possibility. So until, you know, I've, the last maybe year 3.5 uh year four <laughs> do, do you ever uh do you ever have that dream that you get like the uh the call or the letter from your your college and say oh we re- just realized there was an error in the records and you actually we needed we need to take back your uh your degree oh yeah absolutely well and i remember uh, going through some old stuff and uh oh, i know what it was it was some program where Years years later, I was looking at a um, advanced degree at Johns Hopkins um, in their continuing education program or something, and they wanted my college transcript. And uh, <laughs> my college, the college transcript, you know, where there's uh, withdraws or Fs, what they would do is, you know, it was that old kind of mimeograph, you know, that that awful dot matrix printer. Uh-huh. And it would, they'd have like uh, seven or eight um, asterisks on either side. You know? So it was like a black page because it had these asterisks all over it. You know? And it was like this just where most people had one left column. I had a left and a right column full of ink. <laughs> did, did your mission statement say uh, Cameron got the most persistent person you will meet? Well, that's kind of nice. So it's, it's a nice way to look at it. Thank you. <laughs> you know, as a, as a social worker, you know, we're, we're uh, I think we, we're either trained or naturally kind of wired to see the strengths uh, in any opportunity, in any situation. And so I, I would look at someone who did calculus seven times as how can that not be a persistent person? Well, I think that, um, you know, as I was as I was uh, listening to one of your podcasts and um, one of your interviews, and, and I've, I've heard this before where you, you hear the storyline of uh, someone, well, I got diagnosed, you know, a couple of years ago and now I'm, you know, doing this, this, and this, right. This sort of lots of success is happening and it seems like it's a compressed amount of time. And for me, I was diagnosed um, probably, uh, what was that um, mid nineties? Uh, uh, yeah, that was 22 years ago. And I didn't really start to enjoy success. Um, really enjoying what I was doing, um, feeling good about my contribution, you know, until probably 10 years ago. Um, so it's been a process and it still is a process. So when did you, uh, so you went and got your, your certification as a, as a coach, um, and now you, you, uh, coach, uh, leaders. When, when did you kind of go through that process? So, uh, I started working, I, I was, um, at the school that I was working at. Um, I learned about my own ADD. I went and got my diagnosis. I, um, I hired a coach, um, who, you know, the coaches were very new at that time. And, um, one of my former students was taking care of my dog. 
um, she'd graduated and she was just a great kid and, and would take care of our dog. I remember she was coming over to the house and um, I looked in the back of her car and she had this, uh, the old uh, Kate Kelly, Peggy Raimondo um, book. Uh, you mean I'm not lazy, stupid, crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's got this bright yellow color on it back then. I was like, what do you got that? What's that back there for? Um, she's like, what's well, my mom's? And I'm like, what's your mom doing with it? You know, it turns out she's, she's a, uh, working over at Duke in their uh, student assistant program. And she, by herself, started to do some coach training. So I started talking with her, and I hired her to help me do those damnable uh, end-of-term projects. And that was the most. That was the smartest thing I ever did, Eric. That's the smartest thing to sit there and have this person help me just go through and you know, just without judgment, without telling. We sat there and we just started to organize and create this process for getting through this thing where I got to be successful. Right, I, I had eighteen times. I didn't know it at the you know the time, but I got you know. I had a chance to that iterative process, right? Of learning as you go. Yep. Um, so that was my kind of first experience with coaching. The other funny thing that happened was I started to um, uh, um, attract certain, certain students into my advisee group. So again, um, this is about the kids giving them responsibility and ownership. And so they select their advi- their advisors, and the advisee groups were as a, was a really important part of the school. Um, it's, we would take trips together. We'd go off campus into Chapel Hill and Durham together. Um, and I noticed that there was a certain kind of kid who was selecting me. And they were very similar to me. Um, they kind of had the random thinking uh, personality, you know, just like random thoughts and laughing. We had great fun, but we had, I always had the teachers coming up to me and said, you know, your kid is driving me crazy because they're so capable and yet they can't give me what I want from them right at this period of time. So I was sort of putting things together and actually, you know, this was going all along during my process of learning about ADD for myself. So these kids are coming in, um, I'm getting my diagnosis. I'm getting coached by an ADD coach. And I sort of was like, and I, and I, and I was also realizing I'm not a good, I'm not going to be here um, for the long term. I, I just didn't seem there were some, what I called uh, teacher. Um, we called them teacher monks. Uh, the people who were just absolutely committed and they live there and they just lived and breathed. The, and, and I, you know, God bless them. Right. I mean, I just have nothing against them, but they had this, um, you know, this amazing ability to uh, teach and manage, right? Uh, Good managers. I realized that a good teacher needs to be a good manager. And I wasn't a very good manager, Um, you know. Now, I was, now, and when you say a teacher, you mean like an actual, like uh, in academia, in academia, you know, in high school and professor where you're having to manage mm-hmm. um, all these relationships um, to to manage the paperwork, the pa- you know, the process of of um, assigning projects and homework and collecting, getting back on the right time, and that was just it was just a, a brutal process for me. I remember, uh, you know, anytime I had to write papers for, for even in, in high school, um, I was always just amazed, like, oh my gosh, they have to go and like grade all of these, and they're telling us they're gonna get us get them back to us by like Monday. Like to me, I'm like, how are they? Like they must have like hired help. I, you know, it's it's to me that was amazing. Right, and so for me, it was a lots of late nights and a lot of you know, ugly looks from my wife. <laughs> like, you know, you give too much to that school. Um, so that's when I started to realize that coaching, uh, oh, well, I started to naturally kind of, as I was advising these kids, in a way I was coaching them. Mm-hmm. I realized that telling them um, tutoring was not working. And that's what David Parker found out at UNC, that tutoring kids with ADD 
um, didn't really work. You give them information, they go off, they come back and they've forgotten the information. Mm -hmm. But that action learning model of setting them up for success of let's, you know, what do you want to do? And then that, that positive accountability um, to support them on the other side, to have them engaged and to start to build that self-knowledge. Right? You know, uh, Cameron, here's what I want to do real quickly because it sounds like you're about to go in, go in deep to something that sounds really rich and valuable from, from just the uh, uh, information uh, standpoint. So what I want to do is take a quick break and then when we come back, uh, I want to talk about this model that you're referring to. I think you refer to it as the AEC model, um, which I have no idea what that even stands for. So you'll tell us that when we come back. Andrew Acre is an ADHD coach. I think good coaching and whatever is all about, like, just knowing sort of where the person is at and what they're ready for and what they're looking for. That's Andrew. As I mentioned, he's a coach. He's also a member of the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. You know, and I think that like one of the things that I feel like you've heard in my voice as we've gone along is like, yeah, you can go further here. Let me give you some context here. Andrew is working on uh, blogging and uh, so he is creating a kind of a blog schedule for himself to consistently create content. And like and you and you want to go further here and you want me to tell you you can go further here. You know, it's like that. You've done that like three times at least so far. So. Uh, I'm thankful for each occasion. Earlier this week when I was talking about the writing thing, you know, you were just like, you were talking to me about outlining and talking to me about the planning process, you know, asking me questions about what I was doing there. And, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty vague and I was pretty comfortable. And there were some things that, you know, I felt pretty secure and confident about. And I do feel secure and confident about those things in terms of like how I'm putting together the content and what my theme is and stuff like that. But it was just like, you were... You know, you were asking me to be like maybe a little bit more specific. Maybe you can think down, you know, when are you going to do that? How many words? All that stuff. And like, I hadn't really asked myself those questions. It was, it was a push that, that I was looking for. So it's great. I'll be the first one to admit that even I know what to do and don't always do what I know. That's why I work with a coach. And I think it's awesome that Andrew and many others who have gone through this program are also coaches. But yeah, yeah, you're totally right in terms of like the planning with the end in mind thing. And part of my resistance that was like, but I already know that, like I do that, you know, it's like I'm a coach and it's like, it's, you know, sometimes that stuff that we think it's the stuff we think we're good on. And then somebody else comes along who's like, really, really you think you're good on that? Maybe, maybe you could put that a little bit more. Andrew and I were then talking about how much we both love kind of exploring and increasing self-awareness because we can't change those things that we're not aware of. Dude, I've got to tell you, I am here for the mirror. A hundred percent. That is what I want. That is what I signed up for. And it like that is it's being delivered so far. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kudos to you and the rest of the group members for, you know, letting me see that mirror, man. That was Andrew Acre, ADHD coach. You will probably be hearing more from him in upcoming episodes. Make this the summer you get your ADHD rewired. Be one of the first to register for this summer's session. Want to save 400 bucks? Register before March 31st and you can. If you are one of the first six people to register... You can join this group for less than $167 a month. To learn more, go to coachingrewired.com and schedule your free screening today. Next session begins May 23rd. Join us 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Central every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Go to coachingrewired.com for more information, including time zone conversions. That's coachingrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. We are back with Cameron Gott. And what I want to talk to Cameron about now after the break here is, um, you know, one of the things that you have done is uh, at a coach approach is you develop some, uh, some courses and some curriculum 
um, and you do something called fostering mindful change. So I wanted to find out about that as well as uh, a model that you created, the AEC model. Um, so I was wondering if you can kind of share it with us both of those uh, those things. So the uh, fostering mindful change and uh, and the AEC model. Sure. So I think it makes sense to start with the AEC model. I was thinking that too. Yeah. The AEC is a model that I developed um, with Denslow Brown for our advanced ADD coach training program. Um, and it really came out of my experience of um, with around uh, the C part, which is completion. So about 10 years after my diagnosis, um, I had another, this was my second big event. Uh, in learning, you know, Mm -hmm. so the first big event was the diagnosis. And then 10 years later, maybe nine years later was this sort of second big event of, um, and this is this notion of articulating ADD, sort of the true impact for me when I left uh, the teaching position and sort of put my shingle out as a coach, um, I was really struggling, uh, really struggling. I, I was working another job, but I was kind of, I think, timid in my um, commitment, putting it out there. I would uh, do that 90% thing of, you know, work to 90% and then, well, I, well this looks good, right? I mean, it's, again, it's the, that creative um, divergent brain style where you get something w- within 10% of completion and then you, uh, you, you move on. And it was pointed out to my, by my wife. Um, it is such a delicate way that I wasn't really making things happen. <laughs> and she just said, look at the, look at the bank account, brother. And, uh, you've all these the- really great ideas and I see a lot of progress, but we got to get to the finish line here. You know what? It's, it's so interesting. You say it that way. Cause that's exactly how she said it. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear I haven't spoken with her. <laughs> yeah. So she had this delicate way of letting me know that, um, hey, you know, it looks good what you're doing, but it's not bringing in, it's not bringing home the bacon. Um, And so that's when it sort of this whole notion of how ADD really impacted me personally was this notion of um, not completing, not completing projects, not completing actions, but uh, even to a more of a, a molecular or granular scale of not completing thoughts, mm. right? To to engage to a point and then go off. This whole notion of a tangent. Um, and so I knew about tangents. I knew about distractibility. I knew about impatience. But this whole thing about how completion was my bane. It was my Achilles heel um, and the lack of it. So that's how... It, this AEC model came about was, you know, in order to complete, you have to engage to a certain point and then disengage. And I think that I find that ADD is, is that um, it's, it's around that um, it's, it's the transmission, right? It's not the engine. It's the gearbox. Yeah. You know? uh, I, yeah. I can't so we tend analogy. to be in neutral or, or, or uh, fifth gear. Oh man, you know? I, I you know I often describe myself as being stuck in neutral. It's like I'm the engine's revving, I'm stepping on the gas, so you hear a lot of mm, mm, but I ain't going anywhere, you know. <laughs> so that's just it's the thinking of all the things you need to do, but no action is taking place. Right. So um, AEC is basically it's a model based on awareness. So what does that stand awareness. for? Yeah. I, okay. Awareness. So A is awareness. E is engagement. And C is completion. Hmm. And um, I think that where I began and where I invite um, others to begin is really come back. If you don't have good completion, if you don't have good engagement, you can always fall back to good awareness. Um, And so paying attention, paying attention and trying to be mindful of the present learning opportunity. Um, for me, the present was always like a lightning bug that I couldn't catch. I love that. Yeah. But then, you know, how relative bodies, you know, as to me, the, it was the present moving around me. Real, I realized it was actually the present was just there. And it was me, you know, zipping, 
I was the lightning bug, right? I couldn't, I couldn't slow down the brain, slow down and just sort of be in that present moment. I'd be in my thoughts into this vivid, you know, either hopeful or scary future or regrets about, you know, decisions I made in the past. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, completion, I, I think this is a David Allen quote, although I could be wrong. Um, Cause I reserve that right to be wrong. Um, the idea of it's not that we have too many things on our plate is that we have too many things incomplete. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of David Allen. A lot of people with ADD love David Allen, but then have a hard time um, making his stuff happen. You know, one of my critiques of his, like I I like his stuff too. So theoretically, I really like a lot of the process stuff he has. I think one of the challenges I see for people with ADHD with his Kind of approach is that it assumes an intact working memory, and I think that's one of the the challenges um, that's underlying in his approach is that it has the assumption that you can remember that thought for a moment, right? And we right. know that that's not accurate with ADHD, right? And there's also just a lot to manage there. I always had a hard time with the the tickler file. Uh, I don't and, do the tickler file, <laughs> <laughs> and just managing that tickler file. Uh, th- that was too much for me. So, um, AEC is what I use in my, uh, training, uh, training, uh, teaching students. Um, and it's also something I use with all my clients is really, we start with, they're coming, they're coming for engagement. They're coming for results. And what I want to do is, you know, Hey, let's come back and, and let's start with awareness, um, build that. And then we'll move into uh, engagement is really practice, right? It's that practicing Mm -hmm. uh, to develop those habits. And then completion is something we're working toward is what is that meaningful completion? What are those things you want to complete? And then what are those things you want to let go of? So give us some specific uh, ways that you help, uh, both that you help the clients that you work with, with completion and and follow through. Um, And and additionally, how do you teach those things teaching uh to students teaching to students the 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 specific area of of completion yeah um so i think it's tougher for students it is for my clients because for my clients uh, let me back up to the the first question Mm -hmm. about what i do with my clients um so often um my clients come with uh They've got a lot to do. Um, they're often moved to a point of, uh, I'll just say despair, you know, in the sense of a lot of frustration. They don't typically fit into, um, uh, uh, when we think about people with ADD, when they look at that, they're, they don't see themselves because they're college graduates. Um, they've had some success. Um, but typically that success comes at a great cost. Um, lots of uh, time on task, um, a lot of challenges around work-life balance. And so they come to me and they realize, you know, uh, I, I've been doing this, but it's really, I can't keep it going at this rate. So I've got to find a different way. So um, I think that I find that one of the, the two best um, areas of exploration is um, in resources again, developing awareness of resources is people and process. Um, you know, process is much like time. You know, we think of you know, how time is so challenging for people with ADD to understand. Any time is a process, um, processes. Um, so give us a process. Give us a, a, a specific kind of a, um, you know, kind of from a, the tactical level. How do you uh, either yourself manage time and time challenges or help your clients. Maybe you can maybe share a specific, uh, um, you know, strategy that you're helping a a client with. Sure. Um, So I think that um, if you're familiar with, I'm sure you're familiar with Covey's quadrant two Mm -hmm. areas, you know, and and I think that. um, So so important, not urgent. Important, not urgent. And my clients often, they're very good at the uh, urgent. Right, because right. fires get our attention. Fires get our attention. And um, they often wait for the Q2 to move to a Q1. Um, but there are many Q2s 
that don't happen, right? It's the, it's the, and it's those things that are only important to the individual. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of other people don't care about the, a person's Q2, right? They just want you to do your job and, and then go home. Mm -hmm. So it's helping them uh, find um, an entry point or accessibility to those Q2. And we do it through awareness of developing an awareness of what they are and what they're not, right? Um, roles and responsibilities that they want um, and roles and responsibilities that they want to shed. Um, and then uh, regular time on task in those areas. But as they're doing that to, you know, again, it's a very much of a experiential, this is, goes back to my experiential training as an outdoor education leader to letting the experience teach us, right? I'm not teaching. We develop the engagement, right? right? And then we create new awareness from that engagement. Um, and I never, you know, I used to tell people what completion was. I don't do it anymore. Um, because my clients have this amazing ability to deter, you know, create their own definition of their, what is completion for them. And so I just kind of like, I've let go of that. Um, yes, I, there's a model and there's, you know, it says what completion is. Um, but for, for it's, there's a very much of a creative process to discovering that for the individual. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these people, they, I, I, I liken uh, doing things to um, like moving, moving tasks, right? Is we, I use a, a lot of metaphor and analogy. And so it's like moving melons, you know, and the people that I work with tend to have a, a melon patch that's just overgrown. Um, and there are just these massive melons, some are rotting, you know, people are handing them melons left and right. And it's being able to find ways to move those melons in a way, uh, right? Well, in order to do the things that they want to do, right? Those Q2 things, they can't do it alone. Um, they have to um, influence or encourage others, you know, to articulate the desire to move that melon. They have to um, enroll others to help them do that. Um, and so it's this leadership piece I find is very underdeveloped in them because these are doers, right? And they see themselves as doers and they're only as good as the last melon they moved, right? So it's like they pick up the melon, they run, they pick up the melon, they run. But um, they've noticed when they come to me, they got these melons, you know, all scattered along the highway, uh, lots broken, um, a lot discarded. So they're coming to you as a big mess, basically. Um, often, you know, again, these people are like me. Um, they, they have a high capacity for pain. Okay. Right. I mean, they just, their the perseverance is strong in them. And so they take a lot. Um, you could call it stubborn. Um, but that tends to be a, a quality in ADD, I think, too. Like I'm going to do it despite everything else. Sure. Right. And, uh, and so, you know, get the, again, you can, um, people can be, t what I notice applying the AEC model is people tend to be either too far in awareness, right? They're kind of the Buddha sitting in the wheat field. Right. And probably uh, not doing anything about it though. And not engaging enough, or they're the, the bull in the China shop where they engage but they don't have that awareness. You know what? What I like about the um, engagement versus kind of action is it feels sort of like an invitation to engage versus like a direction to do. And I think from a, a as a person with ADHD, I am much more inclined to accept the invitation than I am to follow the direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you don't you you don't push here, man. We you, we know not to push, right? And that's what I've learned is you don't push. And that's you know when, you, when you're working. I don't know if you um, help people with with mindfulness. You know, if you're ever lead, kind of guiding someone through a, a mindful exercise, you know, you always and what I do is I invite people to you know do X, Y, or Z while doing a kind of a meditation exercise versus like directing. You know, it's like absolutely you, you can you know I'd like to invite you to you know, take that breath and really 
you know, pay attention to the how it feels on your nose, or you can just breathe naturally. You know, it's so it's kind of kind of give that you can if you want to. You don't have to. You get that kind of in, that increased um, um, engagement in the desired activity. Right, because pushing doesn't work. That's right. Right, pushing creates a pressure, and that's why they're here is to develop their own pusher, right? Their own motivation. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I like working with really creative, smart people is to let them have that discovery process. Um, You know, but then it's that persistent bringing it back around. It's remind, remembering to remind the brain of, yeah, well, remember these are the things you said were important and we are going to come back to this, right? The other thing that, you know, again, it's that people come with this urgency to change. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's helping them to, to not embrace that, to let go of that urgency, to change their results that they're having within two weeks. Um, It's 47 years that got you here, right? They're 47 years. Right. Right. It's not going to turn around in two weeks, friend. Right. Right. Um, So anyway, I've had a lot of fun with that, you know, and that whole AEC process, that was kind of the fun part that happened for me, Eric, was when I went from teaching to coaching, I wasn't teaching anymore. And then when I got back into training, guess what? I got to do the coaching and the teaching together. Mm-hmm. And that's been like the funnest part is being able to bring that coaching, the, the training back or the teaching back. But guess what? I don't have those 80 those 80 things. I don't have that massive right. paperwork. Uh, that's, that's great. That's great. Yeah. So it's sort of, uh, you know, doing things on my terms that works for me, um, getting clear on what works for me. And so that works really well. Well, let me ask you, uh, um, we're going to wrap this up here in just a minute. Um, now, I know that you had mentioned before that you have a lot of analogies, and I, I love analogies because I think it helps us connect um, with just ways of thinking that are really uh, um, kind of strong and uh, um, allows us to kind of tap into a, a deeper level of understanding. It can be completely related or unrelated to these the specifics of this conversation, but what are some of your favorite analogies when you're explaining any area of ADHD or process related to uh, what you're helping your clients with? Uh, good question. And so I've got, you know, I don't know if it's uh, not enough coming up or too many coming up and I can't sort them out. <laughs> so but... relate to that. <laughs> and I, as I was asking that, I, I had the thought of, man, I'm just glad that I'm not asking me that question because I would hate that question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. Um, so there, there's two and one in particular is, is taking that melon analogy and and um the one i like that i think resonates with people is um you've got your melon patch and um it's typically overgrown the fence around that melon patch is in disrepair right because um there's people coming in it's not that people are coming in and taking melons it's usually they're they're adding melons right it's that uh, too many ideas not enough action now, imagine this, Eric. There's a 10-story apartment building next to that melon patch. Got it? Okay. okay. There's a door right next to that melon patch. So if you open that door and you look up, there's a stairway that goes to the top floor. All right? Okay. This is a different kind of stairway, though. So there's something missing. And this is the ADD experience. So... The idea is to take them in order to, to complete a project, you pick a melon, you get it and you take it up 10 flights to the top of the roof, right? To the, to the rooftop. That's completion, right? Excuse me. That's finishing the job. Uh, what's missing in the ADD experience is the landing. There are no landings. So imagine what happens is you pick up a melon, you start to carry it. And as you're going up, someone hands you another melon, right? How many melons can you hold, right? You start to drop melons. And if you don't have a landing, a melon on a stair is not good, right? It doesn't work. So we, we drop them, we forget them, they drop off, they break. So 
something I do with my clients early on is to identify, you know, where are those landings, right? Can we, instead of trying to race, sprint those melons, you know, from the melon patch to the rooftop is can we, can we place them, right? So those landings are actually visual representations like of checkpoints. What I, what, well, and completion. Okay. That's completion for me okay. is the landing of setting it down and knowing where it is so you can come back to it. Now, as somebody with ADHD, my very first thought, because I, I was closing my eyes to really try to get into this analogy with you. My first thought was, why would I pick a 10-story building without an elevator? So, <laughs> <laughs> so looking at it from a systems approach, I'm like, we picked the wrong building here. That's right. You're like, where's the app for that, man? <laughs> You know, I'm trying to think, okay, quick, quick, we create a pulley system because that would seem a lot more efficient. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's how do we create, how do, how do we, you know, lessen the painful process of how do we get front and focus on system development so we're not just working so hard. Right. And so I think system development starts with, you know, finding natural landings. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I can see and that. And realizing that I, I think that, that, that again, it's that, that whole, the, the stepping stones in the river, right? It's the identifying those places to pause, uh, to, to, and a completion point is actually a place to develop new awareness, right? To pause and disengage and take a look around what, what's going on, right? And then move forward or so, leave that melon and go get another one. <laughs> So as you're uh, maybe sitting here listening to the podcast, enjoying a, a, maybe a delicious uh, bowl of a melon, we are finding this completion point right here, right oh, nice. now. And to, <laughs> and to develop a greater sense of awareness, Cameron, got, where can people learn more about you? I know you have a blog, so if you can leave uh, people with uh, kind of your contact information, uh, that would be great. Okay, Eric, thank you. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. It's a lot of fun uh, to, to go over this stuff with you. Um, my website, where my blog is, is camerongott.com. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty good. Um, and, that's, and that's two Gs, C-A-M-E-R-O-N-G-O-T-T. Right. Dot com. Uh, T for, for time? I don't know. There you go. Two T's. And All as right. always, the links of everything we mentioned during this uh, this episode will be in the show notes page for this episode on ADHDrewire.com. Cameron, thank you so much for uh, for spending the hour with me. And I know that uh, you are joining us with a little bit of a cold, so I want to tell you to feel better. Oh, I will. I'm trying. So thank you, Eric. It's been great. A lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to another episode of ADHD Rewired. And if you're new to the show, welcome to ADHD Rewired. We are more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. You can see a full outline of this and all other episodes with all the links and other resources mentioned during this interview at ADHDrewired.com. Help support this podcast by checking out my sponsors. I use Zoom video conferencing nearly every day, and so can you. Go free or go pro. But please, go to erictibbers.com slash Zoom so they know that I sent you. And you can get a free audiobook from Audible at erictibbers.com slash Audible. And next time you shop Amazon, use the Amazon search portal at ADHDrewired.com. Com. A small percentage of your purchase will go to support this show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. You can also support this podcast by leaving an honest rating and review in iTunes or Stitcher. This really helps other people find this show. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. Don't just be a passive listener, be an active member of the ADHD Rewired community. We are on Facebook. You can like our page, but please submit your request to join our free and growing community. And don't forget to check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into our community. Looking for a coach? If you're still listening at this point and you answered yes, come to my website 
at ADHDrewire.com and schedule your free 20-minute consultation or call me at 224-993-9450. Is your school, business, or organization hiring speakers? I provide fun and engaging presentations full of practical solutions that both educate and entertain. Hire me for your next professional development day or corporate training event. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash talks. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.